Whether you like Vim, hate it, or think it is the greatest text editor of all time and try to bring its functionality into every other program you use, if you've used a Unix-like system in the past 30 or so years, you've probably interacted with Vim in one way or another. And the history of Vim is intrinsically tied with some of the earliest text editors available on Unix. By now, you've probably heard the BDFL of Vim, Bram Molinar, died at the age of 62. Last year, he did have some health scares and a lot of people got really worried about what was going to happen to him, but nobody wants to see someone so beloved that so many people rely on every single day die at such a young age. I had a long think about how I'm going to address this topic because I knew people were going to ask me to talk about it, I just wanted to do it in a way that felt respectful, and the only thing I could really think of is doing a video on the legacy of the project, how it all started, how we got to where we are today, and where it seems like the project is going in the future. And for any of the money made from this video, I'm going to do with it what Bram would have wanted, donating it to his personal favourite charity, the ICCF. With that out of the way, to talk about Vim, we have to talk about Vi. But to talk about Vi, we have to go all the way back to the start, to the first Unix text editor. Ed from 1973, created by Ken Thompson for the very first Unix system. Now technically, Ed is pronounced as the individual letters, ED. But for reasons that should be obvious, nobody actually calls it ED. Whilst Ed is generally thought of as the start, much of its functionality is actually based on an older program from 1967, QED. This was made for Berkeley's timesharing system, a long discontinued system that they were using long before the Berkeley software distribution was ever created or long before Unix existed in the first place. This was created by Butler Lampson, L. Peter Dutch, and Dana Angloin. But when we think of something like ED or QED, it wasn't a text editor like we think of today. Nowadays, we have a full visual representation of the document we're trying to edit. That's not how these programs worked. They were what is known as line editors. If you think of a command prompt or the command entry within Vim, that's basically all you got. And if you wanted to print out anything in the document, you would have to explicitly say, print out this line, this line, this line, whatever thing you wanted to print. And there was a very good reason for this. One, video terminals were still a very emerging technology, and the ones that did exist were very expensive and often were not that performant. Secondly, instead of video terminals, a lot of people were working with hard copy terminals or teleprinters. Basically, instead of using a video display, your output would be printed to paper. So you literally could not have a visual display of the entire document you're editing. You have to explicitly say what you want to show, otherwise it just wouldn't work with paper. By the time that Ed was created, video terminals were becoming a lot more common to see, but until about the 80s, hard copy terminals were still absolutely in use. And by following that older design, it was based around the hard copy terminal use. Due to this rise of cheaper video terminals, George Colorus of the Queen Mary College thought, hmm, maybe I could make a version of Ed that makes use of the fact that I can just draw things to the screen whenever I want to. With this, he created a program called EM in 1975. This is the project that directly inspired Bill Joy to create EX in 1976, basically because that original version wasn't very efficient. EX or X, whatever you want to call it, is short for extended. EX, much like with Ed, could be used as a regular line editor, but also it had a visual mode. This visual mode would just show the entire document. The visual mode was called VI. Later on in 1979, with the release of BSD 2.0, the model completely flipped upside down. In this version, the EX binary was installed with the name VI or VI. If you open this up, it would automatically start EX in its visual mode, still having the ability to swap back to EX mode if you wanted to. From then on, the name basically stuck, and now that's just the name of the project, and EX is considered this separate mode that you can use if you want to go and use it in that mode. 
many of the Vim hotkeys we use today were established back during the days of EX's visual mode. One set of those keys being H, J, K, and L to move around your document. Many people nowadays say this is a faster way to work, this is ergonomic, and all of these other reasons for why Billjoy programmed it to be like this. None of those are true, they're all nonsense. The reason why it's actually like that is because of what he programmed Vion, the Lear Siegler ADM3A. This did not have dedicated arrow keys. Instead, the arrow keys were on H, J, K, and L. That is the entire reason it is H, J, K, and L. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not allowed to change them. Vim is by far the most famous Viclone, but over the years, tons of Viclones have been created. Some of these based directly on the original Vi code base, but some of them were completely independent. But for Vim, this wasn't based on Vi, but it also wasn't completely independent. Instead, it was based on another Vi clone called Stevie in 1987 by Tim Thompson. This is the ST editor for Vi Enthusiasts. It was a Vi clone created for the Atari ST. But Vim wasn't directly based on this version. Instead, Tony Andrews ported the project over to Unix, OS2, and Amiga and Bram's project was based on the Amiga port starting in 1988. Most people don't consider that to be the start of the project, instead opting for the first release in 1991. This release was done on a public domain disc set created by Fred Fish, notable for his work on the GNU debugger. The first official public release of Vim wasn't actually 1.0, instead, it was 1.14. 1.0 has never been seen publicly. It's probably somewhere on Bram's computer. Maybe he's deleted the code. I don't know. All we know is nobody has actually seen it. While we are talking about 1991, and technically the Linux kernel was a thing, Vim was not made to run on Linux. It wasn't even made to run on Unix. Instead, because it was a fork of the Amiga version of Stevie, it was made to run on Bram's Amiga system. A port to Unix didn't even happen until 1992. Also, nowadays Vim is short for Vi Improved, but that wasn't the case until 1993. Instead, initially, it began as Vi Imitation, as the goal was to imitate Vi. But when it became clear that this project was going to be more than just an imitation, it obviously needed a bit of a name change, going with Vi Improved because it's still trying to keep the Vi legacy strong, but improving upon it and making it a more modern system to work with. Nowadays, it's clear that needed to happen. In 1996, graphical user interface support was added. In 1998, syntax highlighting and basic scripting was added. Also in 1998, support for a pop-up menu, file browser dialogues, and other little things that we're all used to today all were added. 2010, Lua support, Python 3 support, 2016, asynchronous IO support, 2022, we saw Vim 9 script and all of these other changes along the way. It is so much more than just an imitation of Vi today. Now, the way that Vim is licensed is kind of interesting. Instead of using a license that everybody knows about, it's using an in-house license called the Vim license. There are no restrictions on using or distributing an unmodified copy of the software. Parts of the software may also be distributed, but the license text must always be included. For modified versions, a few restrictions apply. The license is GPL compatible, and you may compile the software with GPL libraries and distribute it. This is not legal advice, also, I am not a lawyer. If you want a lawyer to go read through this, find an actual lawyer. But Stallman has explicitly commented on this license, saying yes, it is compatible with the GPL v2 or later. Vim is a really interesting project because Bram has never tried to make money from it, explicitly saying Vim is charityware. You can use and copy it as much as you like, but you're encouraged to make a donation for needy children in Uganda. Please see KCC below or visit the ICCF website available at these URLs. You don't have to donate whatsoever, but Bram would like you to do so. You can also sponsor the development of Vim. Vim sponsors can vote for features. See sponsor 
the money goes to Uganda anyway. So if you don't care about voting, you might as well just donate directly and say, here's money, thank Vim. Nowadays, Vim is still going strong, but a lot of people instead make use of a fork called NeoVim. The aim of this project was to clean up the code base because when something's been around for 30 years, it's going to have a bit of cruft build up along the way. So clean up the code base, modernize it, and bring in a lot of features that people have been requesting. And the reason why it was made in the first place is because of a design disagreement a developer had with Bram. There was both user demand and developers who wanted to work on multi-threading in Vim, asynchronous I.O. And Bram just didn't like the solution they were offering. So instead, they just made a fork called NeoVim. As we saw by Bram adding it in 2016, he did agree eventually it was a good idea, he just wanted a different solution. And upon being asked, did they, being NeoVim, influence Vim development, he says, a little bit. They found some bugs and fixed them and then gave them back to me. Of course, jobs and channels are one thing where plugin authors told me, hey, this thing is something NeoVim is working on and we really should have it. I didn't take the NeoVim implementation, I didn't like it that much. What about today and where we are going? So this commit right here is the very last commit that Bram merged into the code base, but it is not the last commit with his name attached to it. This commit right here merged a little bit after his death is the last bit of code that will ever have Bram's name attached to it. It's not a massive commit, it's a fairly small commit in fact, but everything going forward is going to be done by other people in the project. I know some people are worried about what's going to happen with the project now. Is Vim over? Is no one going to be able to merge code into the code base? Like, what's going to happen? As we saw from the fact that something has been merged after his death, Bram is not the only person that has maintainership rights on this project. While Bram's name is attached to basically every commit in the commit log, that doesn't mean that he made every single commit. Most of these are with Bram as the committer, not as the author. He absolutely did do a lot of work on Vim, but he is not the only developer on the project. Also, Vim isn't on his personal GitHub account, instead being in the Vim organization. And in this organization, there are two other members that are marked with maintainership rights, Christian Brabant and Kei Takata. Both of them have been very active in this thread, Vim's future. A lot of people just are unsure about what's going to happen. The immediate plan is Christian taking over the project. Hi, I haven't thought it through as I'm still shocked by the bad news, and I'm also a bit afraid of the responsibility to maintain Vim given the high quality Bram has provided over the years. I'm currently thinking to work through the existing PRs and mainly merge any uncontradictionary changes, mostly bug fixes. And for now, I'd like to continue using Bram's working method, e.g. each change a new patch number, possibly with the exception of adding minor patches for runtime file updates as well to be able to find changes better. But this quite likely won't scale well, because we need to increment the minor version with each patch, so we cannot just click the merge button. Once this is done, I'd like to release a Vim 9.1 or Vim 10 quite soon, after which I'd like to move on to a more modern working with Git and GitHub, not sure about the minor versioning numbers. Also, given the commitment of Bram, I am afraid we won't be able to keep up with the speed that Bram has provided. I'll probably add a few more people to the Vim organization who are known for their contribution to Vim as well, but even then, I don't think we can spend seven days a week working on Vim. So it will most likely be a more traditional way to add changes. Don't expect big changes for now, like tree sitter integration, finishing up the Vim 9 class definition, etc. It will be mostly bug fixes and security fixes. Ktucketer comes in to ask, do you have right access to the FTP server? Are you going to upload each patch file to FTP? Unfortunately, not yet. I don't know if anybody uses the FTP server for patches, but I'd still like to get access so that we can at least keep the runtime files up to date, checking if this is possible. So if that doesn't happen, it's entirely possible we'll see a restructure of some of the Vim architecture, changing to a new FTP server, maybe changing to a new website. It's unclear if either of them actually have access to modify the website and update the website. So 
nobody's really sure exactly what's going to happen. The one thing we do know is the GitHub is going to be fine, and at least for now, development can continue. Nobody can really say where Vim is going to be six months to a year from now. Whilst Bram is not the only developer on the project, he is absolutely the major developer. I wish Christian and Tuckata the best of luck, and I really hope they can get into a flow and keep the project going. If not, it's not like the idea of a Via clone is going away. NeoVim is an incredibly strong fork, and it seems like they're going to be capable of doing their own thing. If you've ever been involved in developing Vim or you want to get involved in the project, I highly encourage you to do so. Right now is probably the best time you could ever get involved. Also, I'll leave a link to the ICCF in the description down below. If you want to go and donate to that, go ahead and do so. I'm not sure what the funding of the Vim project is going to look like in a couple of months, so maybe that entirely changes. For now, though, nothing has really changed. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below, and if you liked the video, go like the video, and if you really liked the video, you can, like, join the Patreon, subscribe, silly bear, pay all that stuff, but this isn't the video for that. So I guess rest in peace, Bram, and see you guys later.